Let us begin the session one, Politics, the Big Picture, 60 Years of Federation. To share with us, I would like to invite Professor Dr. James Chin from Sarawak to deliver his thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the organizers and also I'd like to uh, thank all the Sarawakians who took the time out and come all the way to uh, Kota Kinabalu to celebrate this very, very special occasion together with our uh, Sabahan friends. Um, I think I've been given the impossible job of trying to uh, summarize political development in two states within a space of 20 minutes. So I want to tell the organizers in advance that I will be uh, quite leading with myself in terms of time management. Um, so basically what I'd like to do is basically go through a very, very quick summary of the key political uh, developments in both Sabah and Sarawak. And I'll end with some of the key takeaways of uh, Sabah and Sarawak for the last 60 years. So part one of my talk will be basically a summary of Sarawak, followed by a summary of Sabah. Then I'll talk about some of the historical grievances Sabah and Sarawak has within the Malaysian Federation. So in terms of politics in Sarawak, I think it's quite obvious that uh, in terms of trying to divide up the different periods, um, the easiest way of understanding Sarawak politics is to divide it into four very, very specific periods. The first one is, of course, uh, immediately after independence, like Sabah, Sarawak went to quite a turbulent time politically. Then a very long period of political stability in Sarawak, they call it the Melanau era, and that went from 1970 to 2014. Then we had a very short Adinan era, and that was when we saw the rise of, the very strong rise of state nationalism, and the new era is really under the new Chief Minister of Sarawak, Aban Johari, from 2017 onwards. So in terms of the key takeaways for the first turbulent period, um, I think it's fair to say that for the first few years of Sarawak's independence in the Federation of Malaysia, there was a lot of tension between the federal government and the new state administration led mostly by the Dayats. And this led to the removal of the Iban chief minister in 1966, Stephen Kaloninkan. Um, this was the first time when the federal government showed its hand very clearly. And it showed very clearly to both the people of Sabah and Sarawak that the federal government can really remove the top political office holder. Uh, they can do it very, very quickly. Not only that, they can actually hold a Dewan Undangan sitting and actually pass a law to remove the chief ministers. Um, the, another key takeaway, of course, is that the Dais and the Iban's political grouping in Sarawak never recover politically after 1966. Then we have a very, very long period of political stability. Uh, initially, it was uh, led by Ramang Yaakob. To Ramang Yaakob, he became chief minister in 1970 after a, a very highly contested state elections, and he ruled Sarawak from 1970 until 1971. Uh, I think it would be true to say that during this period, we undersaw the first big restructuring of Sarawak politics, where basically he followed the Malayan model. Eh? Uh, as you know, Raman Yaakob uh, was a strong believer in the Peninsula model because he served for many years as a cabinet member at the federal level. So in terms of the restructuring of Sarawak politics, basically all the Malay and Muslim community were placed under PBB all the Chinese community were placed under SUPP. And he also forced the dissolution of the so-called Chinese Tauke Party, the Sarawak Chinese Association. And in terms of the Dayak politics, he sort of split them in two. Part of the Dayak support went into uh, PBB, another part went to SUPP, and of course the rest who didn't agree with the government ended up with the Sarawak National Party. Uh, what is important and not widely known outside Sarawak was that even in those days, Sarawak enjoyed an unusually high degree of political autonomy because Rama Yaakob had a very, very good relationship with Tun Razad. So Sarawak was basically left alone uh, even from 1970 onwards. The big political turbulence during the Melanau era was, of course, 
In the 1970s, Sarawak suffered from a communism problem. There was quite a large uh, communist movement operating initially out of Kalimantan. But interestingly enough, he was able to negotiate a peace deal with the communists. So after 19, basically after 1974 onwards, Sarawak was able uh, to be largely peaceful. They were able to develop because of a thing called Operation Sri Aman. I think the most important element of Operation Sri Aman, besides the, uh, the peace deal done with the communists, was that uh, he brought the Chinese tycoon under his control. I think this is a very, very important point. It's often not spoken about because people think it's sensitive, but I think it's really a key issue when it comes to politics during the Raman uh, era. Towards the end of his rule, towards the end of the 1970s, uh, it's quite interesting that the largest Chinese-based party in Surat, SUPP, turned against him. Uh, in fact, SUPP led a delegation to Kuala Lumpur to complain about Raman Yaakob. And in addition to that, because of health reasons, he decided to resign in 1981. But not before he placed his nephew, uh, Taib Mahmud, to become the next chief minister. And of course, during the Taib era, a very long era from 1981 to 2014, he really consolidated power uh, into the uh, PBB. It was also this period that there was a split between the uncle and nephew, and it became sort of an open warfare in Sarawak, political warfare in 1985, after Raman Yaakob made a very hard-hitting speech in Mintulu. And this uh, ended up in a thing called the Ming Court Affair, where Raman Yaakob tried to make a comeback. And what was really, really interesting about the 1987 incident was that this time, he gang up with the Ibans, the Dayats, to try to capture power again. But unfortunately, he was not able to do it because Mahathir stood by Taib Mahmud. So this was a really, really important event. I raise it because this was the first diet challenge to try to make a comeback after they lost power in the 1960s. During the period of Taib Mahmud, we saw the second big restructuring of diet politics. Remember I said under Rama Yaakob, he tried to restructure diet politics. But the second big restructuring actually happened during the era of Taib Mahmud. Uh, the Dayak vote in Sarawak or the Dayak party in Sarawak was basically split into many, many different parties and I've listed some of the main parties on the screen. Uh, but what was very interesting was that Sarawak under Taib Mahmud became even more autonomous. He was, he was even given more autonomy compared to his uncle because very early on, Taib Mahmud, very similar to his uncle, also served for a very, very long period in the federal level, so he knew the federal leaders very well. In particular, he knew people like Mahathe very well. In fact, uh, Mahathe became Prime Minister in 1981, the same year that Taib Mahmud became the Chief Minister. So the bottom line was that he was given an extraordinary degree of political autonomy. In fact, the highest among all the states in Malaysia. It was also this period that, interestingly enough, that the Chinese in Sarawak turned against the government and that the Chinese mostly supported the Democratic Action Party. And this has remained true until today, that the urban Chinese, like the Sabah urban Chinese, are more or less uh, supporting the DAP. So during his time, uh, a very short summary would be that he faced only opposition from the Chinese community and all the other community, important political communities in Sarawak were basically under the control of the then Barisan National, Sarawak Barisan National. In the post Melanau era, during the rise of, Adi, sorry, during the time of Adinan Satem, who became Chief Minister, that was when we saw that there was an attempt to restructure Sarawak politics, but unfortunately, uh, he died early. But one thing that he did, and he did it very successfully, was that he brought back this idea of Sarawak nationalism. Huh? So when people talk about Sarawak first, the first time that it was used was actually not during his time. It was actually used in the 1970 by the Sarawak National Party. He took on this idea and he did very well. Won the elections, but unfortunately he passed away. And the current Chief Minister, Aban Johari, basically carried on with this idea of a very strong sense of Sarawak nationalism. And it has worked very, very well. In the most recent Sarawak state election, 
uh, GPS, the successor to the Sarat Barisan National, won more than 90% of the seats in the Dewan Undangan Negeri. That's quite a remarkable record, huh? quite a remarkable record. I think the only other group that managed to, to beat uh, the GPS was during the time of uh, Mustafa Harun when he won 100% of all the seats in the Sabah Dewan Undangan Negeri. Okay? So today, the Sarawak First tagline is very, very popular in Sarawak. Everywhere you go, even in so-called urban areas held by the opposition, the tagline of Sarawak First is very, very popular. So under Aban Johari, uh, basically the idea is to build a state within a state. So you can see Sarawak trying to build their own airline, trying to do all sorts of stuff. And because of the split at the federal level, uh, he has been able to push very hard for a lot of concessions uh, under the guise of the Malaysia Agreement 1963. So the bottom line for Sarawak now is that Sarawak now is very stable, as I mentioned. There's really no real opposition in Sarawak. And in fact, uh, probably by next month, one of the small opposition parties in Sarawak uh, will probably join with one of the component parties of GPS. So basically, the bottom line is that by early next year, if everything goes to plan, uh, there will only be two opposition members in the whole Sarawak Assembly. So let me quickly move to politics in Sabah. Uh, Sabah's story, I don't have to go uh, in detail because most of you here will know it very well. But Sabah politics is really much more convoluted and much more turbulent when you compare it to Sarawak. So basically what I've done with Sabah is that you can sort of split it into five very distinct phases. The first one, like Sarawak, is the early years of independence where you had a lot of political turbulence. But unlike Sarawak, it lasted for a very long time. Uh, my argument is that it lasted from 1963 all the way up to 1994. Then you had a very unique political experiment in the Malaysian system, and that was called the rotation system here in Sabah. Then you had the rise of Sabah nationalism under Warisan, a short experiment for two years. And now you have a consolidation of Sabah nationalism under GRS. So let's quickly look through the first period, of the very, very long period of political turbulence. The first part of the political turbulence was essentially a competition between Mustafa and Stevens. And that competition suddenly stopped in 1970 when Stevens uh, decided to convert to Islam. Uh, so that's the reason why, uh, you know, by the late 70s, early 70s, uh, late 1960s, early 70s, Mustafa really was the undisputed, uh, uh, lack of a better word, the new sultan of Sabah politics. Huh? It was also this time when, you know, he made Islam the official religion of Sabah, and there was a very strong crackdown. So that's the reason why he was able to win 100% of all the seats during the Sabah elections. It was also this time, interestingly enough, because of his lifestyle choices, there was lots of rumours of what he was up to. In particular, there was a very famous incident where he allegedly held a meeting where he discussed the succession of Sabah from the Malaysian Federation. And that was really his downfall. Uh, my understanding uh, was that it was actually a Sarawakian politician who actually told Kuala Lumpur about this meeting. And this, of course, led to a direct intervention by the federal government. The federal government was behind the establishment of the Bajaya Party. Uh, interestingly enough, Bajaya actually did not learn any of the key lessons from the Mustafa era. Uh, Hari Saleh uh, became, you know, uh, a bit like Mustafa. And of course, that led immediately to the rise of Kadazan uh, Dusun nationalism and the establishment of the birth of Parti Besatu Sabah. And they won successfully two state elections in 85 and 86. Uh, things became a bit calmer after PBS was admitted into Barisan National. But in 1990, things went back to a very strong contest between the federal and state government when Parti Besatu Sabah suddenly exited from the Barisan National uh, uh, coalition in 1990. Yeah? And of course, this led to a new watermark in Sabah politics in that the West Malaysian parties moved in. AMNO moved in, MIC moved in, MCA moved in, uh, even Gerakan, a small party, moved in, right? And two years later, it led to the defections, 1994 elections, 
Uh, most people seem to forget that PBS actually won the elections. But what was remarkable was that before the first sitting of the Dewan on Nandangri, the whole thing collapsed because people defected. But the important thing about Sabah during this long period was Project IC. And this permanently altered not only the demography of Sabah, but it altered permanently the uh, political groups and the political arithmetic in Sabah. Because basically what happened with Project IC was that before Project IC, it was possible for the indigenous community with the support of the Chinese community to win an election. After Project IC, the only possible outcome for all elections in Sabah was either a Muslim government or Muslim plus plus government. The indigenous community in Sabah was no longer able to win any elections. Then we had the famous rotation system. The idea was that we had to put in a rotation system in order to win support from the three major political groupings in Sabah. The Muslim Bumutra grouping, the non-Muslim Bumutra grouping, plus the Chinese community. So you can see, right, they rotated the chief minister, firstly under Sakaran, and the last one was Chong Kakiak, back in 2001 to 2003. But the reality was that it never really worked in practice because of the nature of the administration in Sabah. Two years was too short for you to actually do something seriously. So if you look at the statistics, what was really, really uh, interesting was that the economy actually did not recover, despite the fact that you have so-called power sharing in Sabah, the economy actually never did well during the rotational years. Secondly, if you look at the statistics again, poverty rates actually went up. So it was quite interesting that even though the rotation system was supposed to resolve all this issue, power sharing, give everybody a chance, it never really worked in practice. And of course, it was abandoned. And that was when this was a consolidation, the next phase of Sabah politics, a consolidation under Musa Aman, who served as chief minister for 15 years. I think it would be true to say that you know, during his time, he really, really consolidated power in Sabah under Amno. And I think it's also true to say that a lot of time that you can actually describe his rule as what we call strongman politics. This, of course, led to the historic uh, time in Malaysia's political history in 2018. The fall of the Barisan National at the federal level also led to the fall of the state government in Sabah. And this was the second big rise of Sabah nationalism after 85, 86. And of course, this time it was led by a completely new party called Warisan, uh, led by Shafi Abdel and Daryl Lacking. Okay? So the model they used was very, very similar, except that they were having the Muslims on the East Coast combined with the non-Muslim indigenous on the West Coast. They entered into a coalition with Pakatan Harapan, but it didn't work. And this led to the fall of the government in the 2020 uh, state elections in Sabah. Now, what is really interesting about the GRL, GRS model was that if you remember the press conference held by Hajiji, uh, the most remarkable thing during the press conference was that he actually said that he believed that the GRS model should actually be based on the GPS model. In other words, based on the Sarawak political model. But also the unusual thing about GRS was that basically it was a grouping of every political grouping that you can find in, Sarawak, in Sabah who were willing to, to join them. But he was never able to resolve one key issue in Sabah, which is that you know, in Sabah politics, he was never able to remove the ACE, ACH. Anything can happen in Sabah politics. Uh, that issue has never been resolved. Even today, right? Despite what people say, I can guarantee you that the ACH is still alive and kicking. Anything can happen. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly show you through a graph. And when I talk about political stability, it's really, really an important thing for Sabah and Sarawak, right? If you look at the list, right, it is clear, right, in terms of uh, people who have actually served less than five years, you compare the yellow lines in Sarawak and you compare to Sabah, you can see a marked difference, okay? For the last 60 years in Sarawak, there's only two chief ministers who served less than five years. 
and you compare to the site on the, on the Sabah site. Okay? Now, this is very important uh, because the state administration of Sabah Sora is an extremely difficult thing to control and run properly. You really need a long period in order to make changes and really to control the system to deliver for the people. So that will account for why, in some ways, Sarawak has progressed much better compared to, to Sabah because of the long period of political stability. Now, in terms of the historical grievances, federal state relationship, I do not want to go into detail. I'll just quickly show you the list of the major sort of stuff that people are talking about in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, the first one is, of course, people talk about merger without consent, the 20 points, the export of the Malayan political model to Sabah and Sarawak, federal intervention, which I mentioned, the PTI issue, and of course, the marginalization of non-Muslim natives. This model, basically, Barisan national model, basically fell apart, right? Not in 2018. For Sabah and Sarawak, the model actually fell apart in 2008 when Najib lost the two-thirds majority and had to rely on MPs from Sabah and Sarawak. That was the time, certainly, the Malay political class in uh, West Malaysia woke up and realized that we cannot take uh, Sabahans and Sarawakians uh, less seriously compared to the people in Malaya. Okay? And this was also driven, I would argue, mostly by social media as well. And this, of course, led to the historic uh, 2018 government change. But more importantly, for the very first time in Malaysia history, right, one major political bloc, Pakatan Harapan, actually lists Sabah and Sarawak as one of its five pillars for its manifesto. Very, very important. And of course, that subsequently led to the 2021 Constitution Amendment. So what are the key takeaways for the past 60 years? Uh, the first one is something I've mentioned for a few times already, which is that politics in Sabah is of course much turbulent compared to Sarawak. Even if you look at the number of CMs, right, it is quite clear that you can compare five versus 16. Okay? There was a long period of political stability under type which allowed Sarawak to achieve better economic outcomes compared to Sabah. Okay? In terms of one chief minister in Sarawak, Taib Mahmoud, during the entire time he was chief minister, there was nine different chief ministers in Sabah. The third important takeaway is, of course, the Sabah's demographic change, uh, the PTI issue. This has really altered the entire body politic of Sabah. The fourth point is that the non-indigenous in both Sabah and Sarawak have tried to challenge their political status. Uh. In Sarawak, they tried to do it in 1987, in Sabah, 85, 86, and in both instances, they were not successful, and we can still see the results today. The fifth point, federal intervention. I think it is quite obvious that they've tried every trick in the book, and when finally everything could not work, they decided to intervene directly by moving directly into Sabah. But in the case of Sarawak, because the Sarawak political establishment in some ways are different from Sabah, they were not able to move into, uh, into Sarawak. So that's the reason why Sarawak is the only state in Malaysia where AMNO, uh, MCA, MIC, Gerakan are not found. Okay? We also saw the rise of state nationalism uh, from 2008 onwards. Uh, but the thing I wanted to say is that this is not a new phenomenon. It has always existed, but it hasn't had this sort of force in terms of electoral politics until 2008 onwards. The other important point on state nationalism is that for the foreseeable future, it is quite clear to people like myself that you know, this has become more or less a permanent feature of both Sabah and Sarawak politics. Point number seven, Sabah and Sarawak became key players. Um, but the important point about being a key player in the Malaysian political system is that this depends on instability on the other side. In other words, if the Malay political class in Malaya get together, become united again, right? Then they can ignore Sabah and Sarawak completely, just like they did all the way until 2008. So it's quite ironic. In some ways, the ability of Sabah and Sarawak to extract maximum political concessions from the other side is based on the fact that the Malay political elite in Pakistan Malaysia is split. 
If they get together again, I think they will largely ignore the interests of Sabah and Sarawak. So in case of Sarawak, they want to maximize uh, you know, autonomy. So the big thing they want to do is a state within a state. And if they succeed in getting things like health and education, then I think it's quite easy to make the argument that Sarawak will remain the most powerful and the most autonomous state in the Malaysian Federation for many years to come. Point number nine, I think it's quite true to say after 60 years, Sabah politics will remain unstable. Uh, there is no reason to think that GRS can replicate the GPS model and there's no reason to think that they can bring stability to Sabah politics. Because as far as I'm concerned, there's no new personalities involved. Huh? State nationalism in Sarawak, I would argue, is much more stronger compared to Sabah. Uh, part of it, of course, has to deal with Project IC, the demographic change in Sabah, but more importantly, it's because of the strong presence of UMNO in Sabah politics. And finally, the point I want to make is that the key challenge facing both Sabah and Sarawak is the rise of political Islam. So in conclusion, the Malayan political establishment have always tried to assimilate Sabah and Sarawak politically, but it has not worked for the last 60 years. Part of the reason is because the core ideology was never fully accepted in Sabah and Sarawak. Second point, demography, local cultures and traditions among the indigenous people of Sabah and Sarawak were strong enough to counter the Malayan influence for the past 60 years. Using Islam to unify the Muslim population of East Malaysia and West Malaysia has not worked very well for the last 60 years. But of course, this may change in the future. So Sabah and Sarawak has actually gone through a full circle. Now, if you speak to more Sabahans and Sarawakians, I suspect nobody will disagree with a statement like we want more autonomy uh, from the federal government. The future of Sabah and Sarawak will really depend on whether we can get new arrangements in terms of federal-state relationship and what the leaders in Kota Kinabalu and Kuching will do from now on. Some of the problems, of course, that we face in Sabah and Sarawak for the past 60 years can be traced back to the colonial legacy, but the bulk of the political blame will really have to be uh, put on uh, Dr. Mahathe because Dr. Mahathe was a very strong believer in centralization of power. And a lot of problems that we see, especially on the administrative side in Sabah and Sarawak, uh, was due to the centralization policy pursued by Mahathe in the 1980s. The other thing that concerns me is that after 60 years, I think uh, it would be fair to say that the level of political development in Sabah and Sarawak is still quite low, and that politics in Sabah and Sarawak is still largely based on the client patronage and money model. Um, the moving up the chain to issue-based politics is only slowly emerging in the urban areas. Thank you very much.